Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll start. I'm Cheryl Boucher, and I'm an occupational therapist, and I'm in Wayne Township Schools here in Indianapolis for a long time. And then I also previously had worked in a little um, outpatient clinic that helped uh, sensory processing and kids with special needs, and um, love that. And I did that a few evenings a week while I was still working in school, and then I found that's hard to do and to do two jobs. Uh, but it was such a great time and experience. And prior to that, I was in the hospital and home health and so on. So obviously, we're seasoned. So we've we've been around a while, and that's a good thing because it helps with our experience. Um, I also um, really enjoy between the technology components and all the great things I get to do as an OT. Um, but looking at some of the bigger pictures of things in our district. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things going on. It's, it's really cool to be part of it. Um, I don't know if you were here at one of our other sessions, but I always have to add, I have a nephew who is named Casey, and Casey has autism. Um, and he is now graduated with a certificate of completion from Livonia, Michigan. And in Livonia, they can stay in school until they're 26, which is just so neat. And so he has part of his programming is classes in the morning and functional skills and getting ready for the job. And then the afternoon at the moment, he's at Goodwill. And so he gets a lot of neat ex work experience there. I think his biggest pride was he got to be the announcer um, and that the big sales here at the Goodwill in Livonia were going on and he announced them over the PA. He's like the ju gentle giant. He's about six foot four. So I never worry about Casey getting hurt. So he's, a, he's our protector. And I always say he's taught me so much more than anything I've ever gone to. So I'm guessing you probably have somebody in your life somewhere along the way, we all do, that kind of drives my bus. So, Kathy? Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk through a lot of platforms for technology. Um, I'm going to do some iPad apps first. If you ever have seen me present before, I never hold notes. But iPad apps change about every 10 minutes. They change their names, they change availability, they change how much they cost, and they change what they can do. So every time I present on technology, two days before I come, I pull up the latest on iPad apps. And I can't memorize that fast in two days, so you're gonna have to um, bear with me using some notes here. Um, first of all, how many of you have access for your students to an iPad? Let me just see hands. Okay, I'm not talking about a dedicated device for every child, but access to That's iPads. Lot, yeah. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, how many of you use Chrome-based products or have those available Great. for your students? Excellent. Okay, we're gonna cover both of those platforms a lot as well as some others. So hopefully, whichever platform you have available to you, you'll come away with something that you can try with your students, especially especially your students who hate to write. I'm gonna start with the iPad apps. An iPad, in my opinion, is one of the most undervalued teaching tools that we have available to us in education. It breaks my heart when I ask teachers, how do you use your iPad? And they say, oh, I use it for a reward when the kids finish their work. That's, I mean, that's fine, you know, kids can play their game on it, but it's such an underuse of an educational tool. There are so many tools, so many ways that you can reinforce whatever academic standard you're trying to address in a fun way, in a way that is enjoyable for kids, is educationally sound, and is neurologically sound. So look at your iPads in a new way, not just, well, you guys probably do, but as the people that you see using them. Make sure people are looking at them as more than a toy, more than a fun tool. I'm gonna to go through some of these quickly. And can I add, yeah. just because of a thought I'll forget later, but she just said, not just as a fun tool, we actually had enough iPads that we had one that was color-coded that was break time, so the outside frame, the protective the piece, that was different color than the iPad that we used that was work, assignment, getting something accomplished. So if that helps you any, because I know a lot of our kids just see it and it's time to play. So just a thought. We're going to talk kind of fast because we have a lot of things that we want to share. Um, if you want to hear more about any particular tool, come up to us afterwards and we'd be glad to talk in more depth. But we want to cover as many as we can in this hour and 15 minutes. All right, I'm going to start with the apps. If you hear something that you think might be of value to a student, write down the name of the app and that student's name and then look it up on the net or on the app store and see if you think it would meet the needs of your student. All right, first I'm going to tar start talking about the students who have trouble making their letters. 
with letter formation. There are many, many apps available for this. This one is one of my favorites. Um, I write words. There is a light version that's free. So you can get it, you can try it out with your students. It only color, kind of covers the letters A, B, and C. But you can try it and see if it's appropriate for your students. It's one of the better ones. This one was voted by um, the Washington Post as, the, uh, as one of the best apps for special needs kids. Uh, I would suggest if you use this one, get a stylus. So students have the feel of holding a writing utensil similar to a pencil. They can trace with their finger, but there's not as much carryover from tracing with their finger as there is to holding an, a tool that's similar to a pencil. And as an OT, I just want to add, if you have do that, then get that on a slanted surface so that's upright instead of flat because as soon as you're holding that stylus with a little bit of wrist extension, these little intrinsic muscles will be more activated that help strengthen and support for writing, okay? And keep in mind, these are also one tool if they're learning to print and learning letter formation, it's one tool. Okay, this one came out this past year and it's actually my favorite one for kids who are having trouble learning letter formation. Uh, Writing Wizard, it's not free, it costs about $5, but the cool thing about this is it allows a teacher to import her spelling list or import curriculum words that you're working on in sub some -sub subject so when the student is practicing making their letters, they're actually practicing that writing in context, in the curriculum context that the teacher is teaching at that particular time. It allows a data collection system so you can print it out and show parents what you're trying to get across, what the child is progressing in, what the child's struggling with. And it also has capability of switching for left-handed writers, which is pretty wonderful. So if you have a left-handed writer who is having difficulty learning arm hand position and everything this one is a good capability and then look at the next one same company same skills same perks I just told you but cursive okay manuscript cursive same company they're not free they're five dollars a piece but that doesn't mean it has to be a dedicated device for this child and that's the only one that can write it you can pass it have this child do it today this child do it this afternoon you can have a whole group activity of kids and pass it around from kid to kid it's a good way for kids who struggle with letter writing this one handwriting heroes I don't like as well as those last two but it's not bad um, this one is designed by an OT. There are three levels. There's pre-literacy, uh, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, and elementary, they call it. Um, one of the reasons I don't like it quite as well is it only does lowercase letters. So you can't cover the entire thing. It certainly doesn't have cursive. None of the rest of them do. But this one is a good one, too, for some variety. This one, this one's kind of a gimmick. This one's for practicing letter writing, but it's done in a game format. So as kids are practicing scribing their letters, they earn tokens that they can use like a game to help them progress through a game. So not maybe not the most educationally sound of the ones I'm telling you about today, but fun for some kids. Fun is the operative word. The other thing, disadvantage of this one is the teacher can't choose what the kid's going to work on. The letters are all grouped in stick letters or circle letters or letters with a tail. I forget the exact words they used, but the teacher doesn't have the flexibility of using them. This one is the best one if you have a student who has ADHD. Okay, this is a real clean format. It doesn't have the bells and whistles at the others. It doesn't have distraction in the background, and it's free. You can't, oh, no, no, it's now $1.99. Used to be free. Okay, but this one is good if you have students who are distracted, but distractible. Does the same task. Were you going to say something, Cheryl? Okay, all right, I'm going to move away now to students who are learning to write sentences, grammatically correct sentences. There was a, an app that I always had in this position on this slide called Jumbled Sentences. It's free. Some of you probably have it. I wanted to talk about it. They've broken it up. Last month, they broke it up into 10 little chunks. Um, I have to ask you first, do you like jumbled sentences? Me too. Do you have anything you want to say about that? And I'll tell why I 
Okay, I don't know if you could hear what she said. It does have nice levels of sentences. It is free. You can choose a lot of worksheet type things for your kids to work on. The disadvantage is it is really a busy app. The words kind of spin around and there's this daggone song going on in the background all the time that you can't disable. So I find it distracting for a lot of the students. Not for all. Um, the, they've broken it up now, and it doesn't have as much distraction to it, but they're smaller apps. <laughs> so you can't have an entire group work on it for the period of time. It's not bad. It's called jumbled sentences. OK, this one, on the other hand, is fabulous. There's an elementary version and a teenage version. OK, this particular one is called Sentence Builder, teenage there, elementary there. It's for learning to build sentences, and you, the teacher, can judge what part of speech you want to focus on, whether you want to focus on nouns or verbs or adverbs or prepositions, and they build their sentences on something similar to that teenage version over here. It keeps its own data, so you can see how well the student is doing on prepositions, for example. So this is a good one if you have students who are struggling with sentence writing. Um, this one has the same name. I put this in specifically because they're both called Sentence Builder. Different companies, different tasks completely. Just know that there are two different sentence builders. And this one is okay, but it looks much, much different. The advantage of this is you can import your own pictures, your own vocabulary, and use it based on your curriculum that you're doing in your classes. So two different sentence builders. Both of them are good for helping teach kids sentence construction. As Cheryl said, this would never be the only way you're teaching sentence formulation. Of course not. But this is a good way to practice and much more entertaining than a stack of worksheets. All right. I'm going to move on to a different type of thing. The next few that I'm going to talk about are for a little bit older kids, maybe middle school, high school, later elementary kids. This one is not so much a writing app is as a pre-writing app. Tell about this. It's free, so try it out. All of these, if you can find a free version, try them out before you spend any money, even $1.99 on them. It has a bunch of writing prompts, and what you do is um, Kids brainstorm, it's good for group work. Kids brainstorm and they record their stories. Now what they can do afterwards is they can listen to their stories and then keyboard it on a computer. And there's value in that. But this tell about it doesn't have the keyboarding built into it. It's really a pre-writing. This one right here, write about this, is from the same company. So tell about this and then write about this. This one, you can try a free version that has uh, quite a few free prompts. It has 50 prompts, which is a lot for a free version. You can do it with a lot of students and see if it's going to work before you spend any money on it at all. The non-free version, which is about $4, you get 375 prompts. So it's educationally sound. Um, they have it tied to curriculum choices. So you as the teacher can think, okay, I am teaching about um, the human body. That's my unit right now, human body. So you can type human body into this and it'll take you to writing prompts that have to do with the human body. So you can prompt kids to write based on your own curriculum. It's kind of a valuable one. Uh, this one, Write Reader Classroom. This one has moved a lot. I want to put it on here because it isn't really an iPad app anymore. It was, and it's moved from iPad to Google Collaborative Writing. Okay, it's now in the Collaborative Work Group for Google. It just happened this past month, or at least that's when I first saw it available. So this is a good tool. It's good for having your class... People use Google Chrome in here? Okay, check and see if this is available for you. It isn't available on the lower end Chromes yet, but it will be. I mean, they're really proud of the fact that this is going to be in Google Classroom. So, Cheryl, have you done I've anything not with this used one? That one, I have seen that one, but I think it's become just because it just switched over. Yeah, it did just switch over. One of the things they were proud of with this one um, was it honors inventive spelling. 
for little kids. It recognizes inventive spelling and translates it into more traditional spelling. So they don't brag about that anymore. It still has that capability, but they're bragging about the fact now that the two platforms are, are uniting, and that's pretty wonderful. Uh, this one, 60 story starters. This one has gotten cheaper and cheaper. Who knows why? It was $4, now it's about $2. I wouldn't be surprised if it's one of the free apps later on. Are there any SLPs in the group? Okay, it's something, we've had Weber picture cards for a million years, and this is that same company. It's educationally sound. Um, the teacher can choose a lot of, uh, of um, standards, ed academic standards, and base lessons by the academic standards. Beginning, middle, and end, characters, uh, topic, um, plot, a lot of things for book reports, sentence, sentence length, sentence construction, and it keeps its own data. So this one has a lot of educational values. This one, punctuation end marks, is the only one that I've found that really focuses on punctuation. Again, certainly not the only way you would teach punctuation, but good if you're doing centers or having groups, kids work in a group, you can pass a document around and have kids address punctuation through this app. Same sort of thing you do on a worksheet if you were doing that collaboratively, but maybe more fun for a lot of the kids. Um, I'm going to move to some things now for higher end kids who are high school, who have Asperger's, who have aspirations of going on to college and need some apps that they can take into the real world later. That's going to be the next few I'm going to tell you about. Notability is one of those. It's about $10. This is not as good for collaborating. This one is the sort of thing that kids usually are having their own iPad because they're gonna be taking some of these things with them into the workplace or, cape or um, college. This one has the ability to record lectures. Let me read all the things that it can do. Um, the ability to import class notes in PDF the ability to highlight all the keywords, full auditory capability to record a teacher's lectures, and then highlight keywords afterwards. It syncs to Dropbox, it syncs to the cloud, they can send homework back and forth through it. It has a ton of capabilities. It's not cheap, it's $10 for one, and it doesn't share very well among a whole bunch of kids in a class. This one, Notes Plus, the next three I'm going to talk about, there's a new world of handwriting recognition where kids who have terrible handwriting, the app will recognize the handwriting and translate it into digital text. This is kind of new technology. It's kind of like Dragon Dictate was 10 years ago, you know, where you talked into the computer and it recognized your voice and turned it into words. It's kind of like and D Dragon Dictate was 10 years ago. So it's technology that's going to improve constantly. And since I did this presentation in November, the apps that are available have changed tremendously. So even what I'm telling you today, even though this was valid two days ago, it may not be next week. Um, Notes Plus is $10. It has handwriting recognition and word prediction. But right now, the people who are sending in reviews on it don't like it very well for a whole variety of reasons. So don't spend $10 on it until you've waited a bit of time and watched the reviews and see if people are getting more and more pleased with this particular one. The whole idea of having somebody with terrible handwriting have the capability of turning that into something that's legible for all of us is something we all wish for, for our students who struggle with writing. Um, I have two that I don't have a slide for, but I wanted to tell you about. Um, OneNote is a new piece of Microsoft Office. Okay, and the thing that they're also excited about this is they are collaborating with Chrome. So this, even though it's an Office-based tool that in the past would have only worked on Windows, they're collaborating so the platform's gonna go into Chrome. And Right now, it's only available on the really high-end uh, iPad Pros or the Chrome Pro. I forget what it's called, the really high-end, the one where you can write on the tablet. And under the Draw tab, there's a lasso where a kid can write with terrible handwriting. You draw a circle around what they wrote, and that pulls it into and translates it into digital text. 
So it's not available <laughs> easily now, but it's going to be. It's brand new, and they're excited about it. And then the other one, do I have that one on here? No. The other one that there isn't an app, uh, isn't a slide for because they just took it off of the App Store, and it was my favorite. It was my favorite. And it was called um, Smart Writing Tool. Smart, uh, write that down on your notes, because I'm hoping they just took it off and they're going to fix it and put it back on. But it was the most advanced, and it was really cheap, and kids could write with terrible handwriting, and it recognized it and turned it into digital text. It's, the name of it was Smart Writing Tool 7 Notes, and it was free. So it's off this week, but keep looking for it and see if they bring it back. It was truly terrific. This is another one that's okay, same kind of idea, that turns it into digital text, but it's not quite as good as the one I just told you about. These are all my opinions. If anybody, if anybody else uses these, you may have very different opinions, but I just wanted to tell you what my opinions are. This one, Evernote, is more sophisticated than most of our students would need but it's the one that is used most commonly in the workplace. It does everything. It records lectures, it imports lectures, it, it does everything. It has a new feature where a student can take a screenshot of his notes and then access it through a high, um, high frequency word bank. For example, if he's taken all of his notes for the whole semester and he wants to find the note that he wrote on photosynthesis, he can type photosynthesis in there and all of his past notes will pull up. So he'll have everything that has the word photosynthesis in it. Yeah, it's more than most of our students would need, but pretty good. My homework is the best one for your kids who don't write down their homework assignments, and it's free. It's wonderful. Get this one if you have kids who have trouble writing it down. They can. It organizes them in a list for format or on a calendar. It sends it home. It sends push notices when an assignment is due. Parents can see it, and it's free. You, you just can't beat this one. There are a lot available. This is the one you should get. This one I really hate, but some people like it. I think I Cheryl like it. likes it. I yeah, like Cheryl it. likes it. Sticky notes, same kind of idea. You do, you create a sticky note on a bulletin board thing. Makes me crazy. But you may have students where this is very, very effective for them. A couple in here for um, younger writers. We've talked about the older writers now. These are okay for younger writers. This one, Story Builder, is now about $8. So it's not cheap, but they have an elementary version, this one, and a teenage version. Same types of skills, but a uh, higher level thinking process. It's pretty sophisticated. It has a lot of educational standards that you can meet with this app. I'm, let me read it. You can do uh, paragraph formation, integration of ideas, learning to improve higher level abstractions, inference. Uh, it has extensive use of audio clips that are sp specifically designed to help kids with auditory processing and ADA. ADA ASD, sorry. It has consistently high reviews. Kids can record their own voices and do WH questions, story sequencing, inferences, and predictions. All right, ton of stuff. So it's, it's not free, but it has a lot of capability. This one I only put in here because it's really fun and not very educational sound. I would, I, I would recommend only use this for like a recess activity. Okay, I won't say more about it. It's fun for kids, it's free, but not very educationally sound. Poplet is one of those, one of our educational standards in Indiana from fifth grade through high school is for students to use technology to present an oral presentation to their peers to, and then it's all of those categories, to um, persuade, inform, I forget the other ones, I, they're argue, and I, th I think narrative in some form is the fourth one. Okay, anyway, we've got a bunch of educational standards for that, and for the kids who hate to write, that is really a hard task for them to do. Poplet allows them to turn their iPad into a whiteboard and create a presentation like this, importing all kinds of stuff. You can do one poplet for free, so you could try it out with a student and see if it's worth buying it. The whole program, you get a million poplets, so you could have your whole class do one. Okay, but that's five dollars. Uh, don't think if you have kids who have motor issues that they can't use iPads. There are all kinds of tools to make it accessible. All kinds of tools. I could tell more stories about that, but. Go ahead, Kathy. Go ahead. 
Okay, well, I, I want to make sure we have enough time for yours. All right, I wanted to say, in my district, uh, we started out in the iPad world with iPod touches. This was before iPads were even a thing. I hate to admit that, but that was really true. We were really, we were the first district that I know of in Indiana that tried this. But my director made the decision that we were going to start with the iPad touch, iPod touch, in our life skills classes with our kids with very low cognitive skills and very low motor skills. Lots, lots of tone issues, lots of difficulty isolating a digit, i.e. using their finger. I thought it was a terrible idea. I didn't think they'd be able to use it at all. I was wrong. It was a motivating enough tool that these kids, even with their severe motor, uh, motor component and cognitive deficits, I, I'm using that word in this context on purpose. Um, they were successful. So we're not going to go back to iPod touches. Those are those little tiny screens. Fortunately, we don't have to go back to that. But don't make the assumption like I did that because kids have physical or cognitive limitations, this can't be a useful tool for them. It's just amazing the creativity that can be engendered by this tool. Uh, this one, this is another one that went off the App Store this month. So I'm hoping it'll be back again. I left it in because if your kids are trying to write a book report, your elementary kids, this is a wonderful one. It's a really wonderful one. And then the thing that I really liked about this one too is it is great for creating social stories, social narratives. So this is a good one for teachers too. It, you can obviously import pictures, it's easy to use, you've got it at your fingertips with the iPad. So you can use their own photos, it's, it's really kind of good for us. And speaking of something that's good for us, this one unfortunately came out after Cheryl and I finished writing our books. This is easy bib. If you want to write a bibliography reference in California or APA or whatever that, that third one is, you take a picture of the barcode and it gives you in the format, look at that. Think of how many hours on your research papers in college you spent looking up bibliography and trying to format it. Now you take a photo with your iPad and it's done. That's incredible. Where was it when I needed it? All right, this is the one. You know what, I misspoke when I said this one right here is not off the iPad store. I misspoke. This is the one that's off. This is the book report one. If you have kids, especially in third, fourth, or fifth grade, that are learning to write book reports, this one has all the tasks chunked beautifully. Setting, characters, plot, main idea, it's all chunked in very neat packages in the way that we would teach that, and our curriculum requires us to have kids learn, but in an easy to use format for kids. And this is the last iPad app that I'm going to talk about, EduCreations. This one does everything, and it's free. And every time I do this presentation, I tell people, download this one now, because it's too good of an app to stay free. It can do everything. It can, con it can allow kids to create oral presentations. It can record their notes. It can record their voices. There's a whole online library of video lessons that you can align with your own curriculum. It's incredible. You can project it onto a screen so you as a teacher can use it or the kid can use it. And it's just too good to stay free, but it's been free for as long as I've been watching the iPad apps. So it's a good one. All right. Um, I'm going to stop on those. There are more. I'm going to let Cheryl do videos on other formats besides iPad. And then at the end, if we have time, we'll share more ideas that you guys have found. All right. Okay. All right. Really quick brain break. You're going to get your class up. You're going to get their brains shifting from all the tension and all the stress. We're going to increase the levels of dopamine in their system. And laughter comes with an, their laughter causes an increase of dopamine, neurotransmitters, learning memory, it's all good stuff. Everybody's she likes to do it because I can't kay. do it. So I'm going to say one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. three. I can do that, that part. Then you'll do that and I'll say freeze and then you're going to switch and the next part will be one is just clap. So two, three, two, three, two, three.
two, three. three. I just like to watch your faces while I like to do it. It gets worse. And then we're going to go, well, let's say freeze, and then uh, one will be up, two will be woo. Well, that sounded horrible, didn't it? Um, and three. Woo. Three. Woo. Three. Woo. Three. Woo. No, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do what we do. Do it. Um, so, and then I might even throw a third one. But just see if you can do that one. So everybody's going to stand up. So find a partner. Just one, two, three. Stand up. This is a brain up, break. Don't have a partner. We'll find you one. Okay. Turn to a partner. Need a partner. Raise your hand if you need a partner. Need a partner. Okay. I'll be your partner. I'll be your partner. Okay. You, you guys be together. Partner. Everybody okay, ready? One. Go. One, two, no, just two, three. One, two, one, three. Two, one, three. Two. Okay, now freeze and go to clap for number one, and then two, three. Alrighty, go. Okay, you go. One, two, three, two, three, two, three. Okay, freeze. Okay, one is a clap. Two is woo. Okay, go. Ready? Woo. Three. Woo. Three. Woo. Raise your hands. You threw me off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Three. 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 Okay, just for fun, just for fun, one is, two is, woo, three is a jump. So there's really no talking. You got to get movement in two. Okay. Woo. Oh. Okay, you guys did I love it. Just, you were awesome. Oh, man. You can have a seat. <laughs> okay. All right. I feel better watching you guys. I feel okay. better. That was really all about, for me, I needed some movement before I started to present. <laughs> so thanks, guys. Um, the next area we're going to talk about is about some of the other apps and things that are out there. We in our district are big Chrome users. And so everything has gone to Chrome. All the students from third grade through high school have Chrome books. Um, and so that's our direction. And so how many of you are Chrome users? Okay, okay, good to know. Alrighty, so Dragon Dictate has been around for a long time. This one actually is still, this version is an iPad app. Uh, obviously you can also get it on your Chromebooks, on the laptops and so forth. The beauty of uh, voice and Dragon is that it was voice recognition. And years ago when I started, it was really, really challenging and you had to really be able to have a quiet area and the student had to be able to project. Now it's amazing what it can do. It can pick up just about any voice. It doesn't take a lot of training. Um, but I will say that Google Chrome also has great voice recognition and it's free. So depending on your student, depending on their needs, um, if you have somebody with really poor articulation ability, then you may want to go to that versus a Google Chrome product or another voice recognition, but there's a lot. Um, SnapType is a iPad app that was developed from an occupational therapy student. And Kathy and I presented at the National OT Conference, and we got to meet the young lady that she, I, was, I thought it was just so great that she paired with a developer, she developed this app, she has a free version, which works really well, and then the other is $1.99, unless it went up since I last looked. And it is taking a picture of any worksheet. You could take a picture of anything you want. How many of you have used this? I saw a head nodding, a couple of you. You take a picture of whatever worksheet you're using, and then whatever area you touch on the screen where there's a line that they were supposed to give a written response, the student can then type their response. I can then email it to myself or to the teacher and print it out if I need a printed copy the um, version that costs a little money, then you can save in files, and the free version does not have file saving. So, but you could use it in a ton of different ways, but the beauty of it is that I can write on the screen on any worksheet, and for me this was life-saving for some of our students who, even for short answer responses, their grapple motor problems were so severe and school was moving so quickly, I needed to offer another tool. And so I encourage you to look at it, it's just very, very, 
very nice. Okay. Um, the other one is PixWriter. Well, Windows has it too, for yeah. free, on pretty much any computer that you're going to look at in your district, if you're Windows-based. Uh, go under Accessibility. Uh, you'll find it in there, um, speech recognition uh -huh. or voice recognition, and your students can talk into it. And it's better if you have a headset with a microphone, but it is pretty good. For those of us who have normal Arctic, uh -huh. it's accurate. Yeah. I can talk yeah. right into my computer from a seated position, and it picks up my speech. Absolutely. So, yeah. If it's you just free. look under voice recognition, Google, you'll see the exact name. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing the power that we have. I was thinking about one of the speakers was talking about all the things that used to be for special needs. Now is truly universal design. We have everything that you don't even have to get out of your chair for anything. So it's amazing. Um, so again, on SnapType, I encourage you to try it out. It's just so, it's a wonderful little program. PixWriter has been around a really, really long time. Um, you might find that you have it on your PCs if you have them in your buildings. But what I loved about PixWriter is that it allowed you to use picture symbol or uh, picture boxes, cells, and I could create a full page of them to create sentences for students who were really challenged. Or I could create just the basis of what a sentence is, and that might be just enough for some of our students. So I could use it with my life skills students, as well as students that were in gen ed classrooms in a fourth grade classroom. What I liked about for some of my older students is that they had writing ideas, but remember like for kids for instance, with autism, an evidence-based practice of using visuals. There was their visuals down at the bottom to as, act as a working memory. And so that they had an idea, they had a thought, they couldn't hold on to it. But if I can give some visual supports around that, it was at the bottom of the screen, and then they could go ahead and type. We also used a lot for social stories because it gave the, the picture symbols would be plugged in. Um, board makers wonderful, but this was really, really handy as well. You're able to do a lot of things. And then it also was teaching, this gives you an example here where this was just a sentence about Halloween versus more, more cells were used up here for a student who was able to do more. You could turn off your picture symbols, but we had some kiddos who could write given the pictures, but they couldn't read it back unless those pictures were there with it. So we kept the pictures for them. Other students, I'd turn off the pictures during their actual writing part. This worked really well for a student with learning disability. He could not, his, he was, had great ideas, but he could not spell or get the thoughts together um, without some extra support. So it was a great tool for him as well. This one has 10,500 word picture pairs in English and in Spanish. So that might be significant for some of you too. Yes, yes. This is Read and Write Gold. And who's, who has used Read and Write? Okay, Read and Write, if you have access to Google, Teachers can get a 30-day free trial of it. In our district, we have it, again, on all of our computers for all of our students. Um, and what Read and Write does is it has word prediction in it. It has uh, text-to-speech. It has vocabulary builder. It has a lot of nice little tools in it. Um, and we're going to, whoops, whoops wrong we one, don't want to do that one, one yet. Um, and read with and Read and also. Write, the beauty of it is that it is the students can easily access it. The toolbar is very user friendly. I really, really like this program. And we as OTs in our district compared, because we had been Don Johnston, and we had a lot of uh, you know the literacy suites of all solo with Draft Builder, Read Out Loud, Co-Writer, Write Out Loud. All of those were wonderful programs. They still are. And when we switched to Chrome, these were introduced, and we were like, oh, no, we love our Don Johnston products. And at the same time, all of a sudden, all these Chrome products are great. So we're really, really pleased. And we're going to just show a little tutorial. Google Apps for Education are everywhere. You might well be using them in your own school, along with millions of other students and teachers. Google Apps are great. But what about students who need a little extra help? Working with documents and the web can be a challenge for struggling readers and writers, English language learners, and students with learning disabilities like dyslexia. Now there's an answer to help every student get the most from Google. Take a look. Read and Write for Google Chrome is this friendly toolbar that installs neatly in your Chrome web browser. So it plays nicely with all these classroom devices, PCs, Macs, and Chromebooks, too. It's there whenever it's needed, making it easier for students to work with Google Docs and other documents like PDFs or EPUBs. It also works with web pages. Okay, let's see how easy it is to use. Highlight any passage of text and hear it read out loud. You can pick different voices and adjust reading speed to suit any listener. 
Speech-to-text accurately transcribes your students' words as they talk. It's ideal for capturing thoughts on the fly, especially for people who find typing tricky. Word prediction helps reluctant writers, offering word suggestions as you type. There's a talking dictionary, picture dictionary, and fact finder that make research faster, easier, and more fun. And there's a translator for other languages, such as French and Spanish. These colored highlighters are really useful for collecting and summarizing key information. Just pick out key points and gather them together in a new document. Why not try Read and Write for Google Chrome today? It's already being used by millions of students worldwide, and you can install it free at the Chrome Web Store. Um, the part when he was talking about highlighting the words or highlighting sentences are important parts of a document, and then when you click, it puts it into a new document. So think about how, how valuable that could be for our students when they're overwhelmed with way too much that they have to look at, and so that if it's already been highlighted or, and or extracted for them when they start to look at what's really needed on that document that they need to know. For other students, it's just going to be looking at who are the main characters in the story, highlighting it, click and drag it over to the other page. So it has a lot, a lot of nice little um, bells and whistles on it. The other thing I really like about it, too, is that she talked about a vocabulary builder. So if kids have vocabulary words that they are supposed to write down the definition, get it on an index card, learn what those vocabulary words mean, which is the purpose of that task. Why can we not have them do it in Google Read and Write? And the students, once the words are typed, or a, a teacher shared that document through Google Docs, then they can, all they have to do is highlight the words and click on that area of that part of the toolbar. And it takes those words, puts them in a table with the definition and a picture symbol if there's one available. And now the student has more time not only to do what the task was meant for, study and learn those vocab words, but they've also got visual representations to remind them. And our struggling readers then have that tool that they can just listen and see what those words and definitions are. So it has a lot of power to it. Um, I think when we look at word prediction, really think about how you can use word prediction, not just because it's great because I, I'm a bad speller, so that's going to help me. Yes, it's going to help our struggling spellers. Um, but it also helps kiddos with, again, poor working memory, slow processing speed, those abilities that it takes me such a long time to get it out on paper in any way, shape, or form. When I see that word and hear that word, I can click on that word. I don't have to type out the whole word. So it's not a crutch. It's a needed tool. I can't use it on standardized tests. But if I can become and if it increase my writing skills, increase my reading comprehension through using these tools, chances are I'm going to be able to do better on when it comes down to standardized test. So it's got a lot of power. The other thing with word prediction, I just love that you can be able to use bigger vocabulary. I will have so many kids who will say they'll use nice, they'll use pretty, they'll use it was a fun, instead of amazing, fantastic, magnificent. And they type in two to three letters, and those words pop up on the screen. And then you get to see what they really want to share, what they really know. So it's exciting for them. We'll have kids come over and say, now, listen to what I wrote. Research supports that kids need to proofread what they've written. Many students don't very thoroughly. So whether they're doing it themselves or they trade Chromebooks or iPads, they can listen to what they wrote through text to speech. Or, yeah, text to speech. And so I'm going to listen back to what I wrote, catch, man, that was awesome. I'm an amazing writer. Or two, ooh, I've said I like 15 times in this sentence. Or I've repeated myself five times. Or whoa, I was talking about this subject, and all of a sudden I've swayed to another subject. So it gives them the, the privilege, the fun, of being able to correct their writing and or go, this was awesome. Now, I will tell you, I had a student just yesterday. I was talking to Kathy about a, a lovely friend who has autism, and he's a brilliant kiddo, but he was telling me a story about a video game, and he was in the video game, but I wasn't supposed to know he was part of the video game until the very end of the story. And he was going into animatronics and different things, and I really had, you know, I had no idea what was going on here. Um, but when he listened back, he said, sounds good. And to him, he did. So we had to chunk it down a little bit more, work on some of the components. But by giving that tool to him, he had so much more power in his writing. Um, I think also the ability to be able to have speech to text is great for brainstorming. So when you've got kiddos, again, working memory, I can't hang on to it long enough. I've got to get it out there somehow. What can I do? Let me just spiel everything I want to say into the computer. And it's right here in front of me. 
And that's awesome. And now I can clean it up. Now I can change punctuation, change paragraphs, get rid of the stuff I've already repeated, look at my spelling, um, do what I need to do. But we can use speech to text in so many great ways as well. So keep that in mind. Um, and there was one more thing on this one I wanted to mention. Uh, it, it just does a ton of stuff. The talking dictionary is wonderful. How many times kids are reading something, they don't know what the definition is, it's right there. Anything that you can go in on the internet through Google, it will read that text. So how many times our kids are either, are we working on reading fluency or we're working on comprehension? And if I want to just work on comprehension, let them auditorily read. I can auditorily read and I'm going to pick up much more information than when I'm trying to just decode and read and pick up my speed in my reading. So just another great tool to keep in mind. And the last thing I think was the, um, oh I know what it was, it's a, another little tab that allows the student to actually read and it's, it records their reading so that when they are reading that they can hear themselves back how they sounded when they were reading. And it's another nice tool that could be used in a lot of ways. So. Obviously, I really, really like Read and Write Gold. There's 30 days free trial. Now, whether they're doing something extra free, she mentioned in the, the video about free, and so I don't want to sway you the wrong way. I know we paid for it in our district. For, I don't know what the total was at the time. I apologize. I should find that out. We go ahead. We're going to just show a quick video about WordQ for a second here. This is a demonstration video of how to use WordQ. WordQ is compatible with most any word processing software, and today I'm going to use it with Microsoft Word. Right now I have the settings set for it to give me a list of words and for it to read each word as well as each sentence, but I'm also going to show you some other features that it can do. You see, I can type in one and it'll finish today. the word. And then it gives me a list of words that it thinks might come after today. I am demonstrating how to use word Q. Today I am demonstrating how to use word Q. You can see after um, you finish typing the sentence and you put in your punctuation, it will go ahead and read that sentence back to you. As you type words, word, Q products, what? Word you are using got to use and eats the word after you type it. As you type words, word Q predicts what word you are going to use and reads the word after you type it. It. Word. If you happen word. to be using Q. word Q Allos. on a computer uh. that has touch screen, the student can just touch that word in the drop down menu. They don't have to finish typing the rest of the word. So when she was doing demonstrating, and demonstrating was number five word, as soon as it showed, the student can push demonstrating and it'll pop into the text. So that reduces a lot of keystrokes for a yes. lot of kids. Yeah, and that's why I was talking about those kids with the working memory, processing speed. I just remember I had a little gal in particular, and always comes to mind that it was almost painful to watch her try to get her thoughts out. And we did a lot of graphic organizers mm -hmm. along with, but once she got onto the computer, it helped that she, she had to have word predictions so that she did not have the painfulness of trying to type out all the letters. She would have lost her thought. So as you scroll over words, you can decide if it was, because a lot of our kids think that the beginning of the word and that's it, and they go ahead and click on it. And we always are trying to tell them, please stop. Mm -hmm. That's with also with um, Google Read and Write. Scroll over, listen, was it the word that I wanted? Um, and then click on it, and you may find that it wasn't the word that you wanted. Um, but the beauty of that is, again, shortening up the sentences. Um, the other piece that was on that slide, and, and that word cue was free. 
So that's the beauty of it as well. Um, and you can also, on Google Read and Write, I'm not so sure on WordQ, that you can turn off, that it's not going to read after every word. We have some students that find that incredibly annoying. They don't want to hear it until the end of the sentence. Others find it, they like it, and they get feedback right away that that was not the word or it was, they didn't spell, the, spell it correctly or hit the right key. So it just depends on our students. Um, I had just the other day a student who's just, he wanted that sound off. He did not want to hear it every single time. He loved finding the words and writing, but he wanted to wait till the end. Um, if you uh, have on your, your slide is OTs with apps, that's a great website. And I just wanted to bring up, have Kathy pull this up so that you can see some of the things, and I know it's very tiny print for you in the back, but I'm looking at, there is cursive writing if you want cursive writing, there's writing wizards, some of the things that Kathy talked about, they have combined and gathered for you every single piece of kind of technology that you would want for your kids and students. So it's just wonderful, all the way down to, um, Key, nice, clean key, keyboarding programs that are free as well. Um, Abilipad is a great program, Keystrokes Lite, and all these keyboarding apps that when you're looking for good ones, they're right there for you instead of you going on the website trying to figure out. Um, I had an opportunity to hear them speak at the AOTA conference as well. So this site has just a ton of information for you. So anything you want we're talking about, go back. Okay, DocHub, if you are on Google Chrome, <coughs> DocHub does what I said SnapType did on the iPad, where you're taking a picture of the worksheet and you can type on it. DocHub converts a PDF into being able to type on it. So it's a wonderful program, it's also free. And I have just a short demonstration of it, so you have a connection to say, is this worth it best when you have a visual yourself? This video is on how to add text to a PDF. So in my Google Drive, I have downloaded a PDF file of the Tech Truck Science Camp Teacher Recommendation Form. It was a photocopy. I scanned it through the copier in the office and saved it as a PDF to my desktop. So once I imported it, I can open the teacher recommendation, and I can see that it gives me space down here to type, but as a PDF, I'm not able to actually type on this. But Google Docs gives you the option of open with, and if you go to Doc Hub, View, Edit, and Sign PDFs, it will open the file and give you the opportunity to type onto the PDF itself. So here is the PDF that I scanned from the copier in the office, and now I can add text, insert text, and I can add it right here, and I can type in the student's name, and I can add text again, and I can add their mailing address, I could add another text box, and you can see that this is very handy for filling in forms and making it look professional. You could help students do this as well. And then down here, I can add a text box, and I can type in a whole paragraph, and you can resize the box. Um, and then you can print this out, and you actually can also save it up here. It asks you if you want to export to Google Drive. So if I export this to Google Drive, it will say it's saved in Drive, your document was successfully saved into the Google Drive, and you can click View in your Drive. And now you can see that you have a new PDF file with your typed information on it, so no need to get a typewriter out or try to line up your text any other way. I hope you found this helpful. So if you think about how he could use that on DocHub, then we just printed it out. He had a sheet of his graphic organizer very neatly typed, and then it was a great reference for him as he was doing his work. So it's a very good program. If your district is still Windows-based, you can do some of those schools through Acrobat, through the Acrobat Reader, um, Acrobat Write, that sort of thing. You can have your students do that. Um, they're, as we've said, they're combining these two silos of Chrome and Windows, but there are a few programs that haven't made it over the transition to be applicable to both yet. Um, Dictanote, I like. Um, I think it's got some nice little features. Again, it was free. It was really accurate with speech to text, so I can talk to my computer and take my notes, and I can save my notes in files as well. Um, and so it's got some really nice little features that I would recommend it. And, and I like anything that's free, I can add it, and if I don't like it, I'm going to take it off. And then I can see, oh, I could use this with some of my students as well. 
Um, uh, Kathy, if you'll click on mm -hmm. Ditch That Textbook is Matt Miller, a technology guy, and he's got a great website, and I just want to show you um, under the graphic organizers. Mm -hmm. Okay, just scroll on down. I just want you to see, it's just a great website. But if you click on any of these from the Venn diagrams, KWL, timelines, evaluations, cause and effect chains, uh, you know, main topics, flow charts, all of these are free downloads of graphic organizers, which is wonderful. If you're, you don't have to search, he's pulled some really, one of the, the best ones, unless you've got a student who has a great interest that you want to include. So lots and lots of good things there. And then the next one is our, let's see. I'm back to just one to. That one? Yep. And then Google Lucid Chart is also a great, you know, if anybody use Inspiration, Inspiration is for older students and it's graphic organizers and it takes a little bit more bells and whistles. So if you've got more mature students, high school students, this is a really nice free graphic organizer. And just show for a minute, just so you'll have an idea. Lucidchart is the best way to create and share professional diagrams and communicate visually online. With the high demand and use of our product for mind mapping, we felt it was time to introduce more sophisticated tools dedicated to an intuitive and customized mind mapping experience. Start mind mapping by creating a new document or by simply turning on the mind map library in your editor and dragging out the unique mind map shape. This shape responds differently than all others in Lucidchart. Instead of using your mouse to click and drag lines in new shapes, you can easily populate new ideas by using your keyboard shortcuts. Tab forms a new child idea, Enter forms a new sibling, F2 edits the text field, and the arrow keys can be used to navigate around the map. When each idea is created, the text field is automatically selected and ready for your entry, and you can create a new line by pressing Shift and Enter at the same time. When finished typing, press Enter again to commit the text and then use Enter or Tab to move on to the next great idea. We have engineered a custom algorithm that places each new idea in a spatial relation to the previous one. But if you want to make your own unique look, simply grab the parent of any branch and move it to wherever you like. And if you're not happy with your placement, you can either undo the last action, or for a larger reset, you can use the Auto Layout button from the Shape Options panel. With each new level of ideas comes a great new color. This helps keep your thoughts visually organized as you get deeper in thought and mapping. We've provided a default color set, but you can change each level by simply clicking on the color box in the Shape Options panel and customizing the look to your needs. We are passionate about you having a collaborative, intuitive experience as you create mind maps. When you have a great idea, write it down. When you want to map it out, use Lucidchart. why we need graphic organizers. You know, many of our students, again, struggle with their organization of their writing. Surprise, surprise, right? They have difficulty with that sequential thought, that making sense, that mind mapping of seeing the whole picture and what order those pieces and events are happening. And so the power that any kind of graphic organizer can give to our kids is just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a strategy that they can use wherever they go. And if you find a particular kind of graphic organizer that your student says, I love this, or this worked, or look what you produced, then keep using it and make sure they've made the connection that they're the advocate. They're trying to make sure that they have it wherever they need to go. I like that this has color coding to visualize different parts of your writing. Um, I like that they can go in and size it, add a word, or they can make several sentences. Uh, I like to stay with just a few phrases, or a phrase when I do a graphic organizer, that they're in control. And we all know we have the students that this may not be the best tool for it. They're going to get so caught up in making the, square, the shapes and the squares and you can add some visuals and so forth, but it's going to be a really great tool to have for their writing needs. Um, and then, uh, yeah, they did one over here, in fact. They used all pictures and you could pull pictures from a book report um, on ideas. And so again, that visual representation helped to really keep them on task of what they were writing. This is another mind mapping. Uh, it's also free. It's connected mind. Um, you can actually draw little squiggle lines of the directions of how you want to make your connections. So it might be something as a teacher, either one, that you want to do and create early and have for all the students or a group of students that you're working with. But big enough, 
large enough and colorful enough that they can see. Um, what I really like about the Google Chrome Mercury Reader is that it takes away all the distractions, all the ads, all the extra pictures in a page of text so the student can see a clean version and just concentrate on the reading part of it if that's what they need to do. So it's just a nice cleanup tool. Okay. And then we're going to, um, in a minute here, do you guys have any questions on anything or has anybody had anything that they have used that they particularly like that we have not mentioned? I'm always curious to see. I almost, nine times out of ten, I will tell kiddos who want to do something in writing are going to use a keyboard over saying, would you rather write it? And yet, I will preface that with, I will have some kids whose printing skills are very dysfunctional, but my dysfunctional motor memory for making those letters is faster than what I know where letters are on a keyboard. So if our kids don't have good keyboarding access, they're not going to be able to be great computer technology kiddos. So we've got to give them the keyboarding um, program time to practice a good program. Um, I think ideally that third, I shouldn't say think, I know I've looked at the research. About third grade for kiddos, their hand span developmentally is big enough to hit home row keys. Developmentally, they're also becoming more mature, so they are more focused on actually doing that instead of just getting to the games that are in between the lessons. Um, and so when kids are taught keyboarding, unless it's, I don't want to say that you're micromanaging, but as soon as you turn your back, they're usually trying to hurry up to get to the keyboarding game, which is a lot of fun. I don't blame them. But we got to watch and really encourage so that I want to teach kids a lot of things, but I want them to understand why they need to learn keyboarding. And usually, if you're a good keyboarder, if they watch you keyboard, they're like, wow, how do you do that? Well, I used to, back in the day, I won't say I was a typewriter, but it was. And I learned and I practiced on a typewriter how to keyboard. So we've got to really set the standards high for our kiddos. Um, I know there are keyboarding programs out there for very young children. It's okay to get them exposed, and if they are familiar at least to where letters are on a keyboard, if they're hunting and pecking, but I would encourage you that even for the hunt and peckers, have them get both hands on that keyboard. One side is the left side of the keyboard, the other hand the side is the right side. I see too many of my kids that have poor bilateral integration. Um, not one hand is real dominant and one hand is recessive, but instead that hand, other hand is just resting in their lap and they're doing everything with one hand. And well, in the whole text, texting world, good point, is another feature that is, is really throwing us off for that too. So it's hard to go back to now typing even. So yeah, our texting world is a whole different thing. So just encourage your kids to have time. And I'll say to parents, if you can do it two to three times a week that you can practice keyboarding, just for 10 minutes. It doesn't have to be a big deal. We've had times in our classes where part of, um, there was a block of time that kids went through programs for six weeks in elementary. It used to be in seventh grade, it was a class. I think it's changed now in some districts. Um, but all I know is that we really have to have good keyboarding skills in order to really be proficient. We've had kids with standardized testing, we say, ooh, do we mark assistive technology needed or do we wait? And we'll say for many of our third graders, I think they're gonna be a tech kid next year. And I know a lot of the standardized testing is going all, all onto computers. But right now, they may be better at printing even though it's poor than putting them on a keyboard. And then on the flip side, I've said, gosh, I don't think they're gonna write very much, but whatever's gonna be slightly read needs to be done on a keyboard, and it might not be fast, but they have extended time, and it's gonna be able, they're gonna be able to read it. Whoever is interpreting that test is going to be able to read it. So it's really individual. So I encourage you when that little box marks assistive technology. Um, but I have a ton of kids, I don't know how you are in your districts, but I have a ton of kids who I've yes, said yes to for specific purposeful reasons um, that they need word prediction, and speech to text or text to speech and or all three to help support their writing and their reading. Um, so it's a good thing. Um, before we close, and what's our time again? Five minutes before all done or five minutes before 10 minute questions? Five minutes before all done, perfect. Okay, um, I wanna open the door just to the idea that I loved and I heard a, a speaker a long time ago and I loved his words as well. His example was we watched a video of it was a car accident and it was a fender bender at a four way stop. But the neat part, and it was for older kids, and the kids were all to watch this, and then they were gonna have a conversation about, you know, who was at the intersection first, who caused the problem of the accident, you know, when the policeman came, what was happening, what then happened, what do you project, or what do you project is gonna happen in the beginning. Um, and so it was a really great visual way with video to do a writing prompt. And so think about as you watch Gus, uh, you know, who's the main character in this story? What do you think is gonna happen? Where are they at? 
what happened next? What was the solution to the problem? And so you could expand upon this greatly. And Kathy and I can show you, we'll back up afterwards to show you the site that we got this from. And it's on your, your handout um, as well. So this is Gus. No, Gus. Jeez, Gus, we can't have anything nice, can we? <laughs> Not taking it in the house. Gus, no. No. No, Gus. No, Gus, no. Oh my God. <laughs> That's Gus. I, I've seen this so many times, but I just love it because I just, I, he's hilarious and he's got a whole series of Gus videos. So he and himself could be a writing prompt every day. And then this is from the School Express um, website. And then if you scroll down, Cap, just to show, mm -hmm. there's a whole list of, um, these are all, all kinds of animal ones. And then there's other ones. There's inspirational ones. There's music and dance. Um, there's just a ton of them. There's a really great one about paying it forward of a young girl who um, just decides to start giving some little treats out and monies out and so forth and what she's done and then other people to pick up the, the trend and so there's inspirational things but really nice little short writing prompts but with the power of video which is really cool um, so it's just in, we want engagement we want our kids to make predictions you could stop the videos in the middle and say you know what do you think is going to happen here what's going to happen next and then let's see and um, the children can have conversations at their table so lots of great ways to use it so and I think we are just about out of time um, and so if you guys have questions, we would be glad to answer. We can stay after. And you guys have been a great audience. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you.